Welcome back, students. In this lecture, we're going to do a quick review of what we mean by server-side programming and why we need it. With client-side only programming, we can download and display our data, but we can't make any changes to that data, at least not changes that will affect the data that is on the server. In fact, we could put the entire application locally on the device and view it completely offline without an internet connection, because once it is loaded, all we do is view it. Maybe we can do some analysis with the data that's on it, but we're not going to make any changes to that data. This is fine for many applications. For instance, if your organization spent two years classifying the vegetation of Uruguay and wanted to make that information available to the public, the public isn't going to be making changes to your data. They're just going to want to see it on a map, where the vegetation boundaries are. And this is an example of an application that probably does not require any server-side code. You could convert your vegetation polygons to a GeoJSON file and load it from there straight into Leaflet. We don't need server-side code unless we need to access a common data store. This usually means working with data that is stored in a database on the server. But it might also involve uploading files such as a photograph or, or a document from the local computer's file system to the server. For instance, sticking with our vegetation theme, if your web application involves allowing the public to add information, such as the location of a specific type of plant they saw, or even to upload photos of that plant, then you will almost certainly need some server-side code. Usually, we store data in a database on the server because it is dynamic, which means that it changes frequently. We might want to change it ourselves, or we might need to see changes that other people have made. And we'll talk more about this soon. But another reason for using a data store on the server is when we are dealing with large data sets. GeoJSON works fine for smaller amounts of data, but it's not the most efficient for large data sets, because you have to read an entire set of data at once. Now this may work okay for our vegetation map of Uruguay, but if that map were very detailed, or if it were a larger country such as Brazil with hundreds of thousands of polygons, it might take a long time to load. With raster data in web applications, it is common to use tiles to increase performance. Tiled raster data allows you to take only a small chunk of the data rather than the entire data set. Usually it's enough to fill the screen of your application. And this is how Google Maps can be so fast, even though it has detailed maps of the entire world. You don't have to load the entire world, you just load the part that you're looking at. And I should mention that tiles can be used with vector data as well although it's newer technology and not as common. One advantage of storing data in a spatial database is that the data can use spatial indexing to improve performance and quickly retrieve only the data that you need. Consider the Uber application. They have tens of thousands of drivers around the world to keep track of. But when you call one, you don't need to download the location of every driver. You can just search for drivers within a few miles of you, and a spatial index will make that process much faster. Now let's talk a little bit more about dynamic and spatial data. At the most basic level, static refers to data that changes infrequently. This might include things like digital elevation models, because the topography of the Earth's surface usually doesn't change very fast. The same goes for soils for similar reasons. Even some human-created features like road networks and the locations of cities do not change very quickly. Dynamic data, on the other hand, refer to data that change frequently. This might be something like wildlife locations. And usually you don't have data specific to an animal's actual location. Although with some GPS and satellite tracking technology, you actually could. But in the context of our project, it might mean a new raptor nest that was found. Or another example, about 10 years ago, I was living in a small mountain town in Colorado. And a local newspaper printed a map every morning of locations where bears had been sighted the previous day. And I was approached by the newspaper to see if I could put together a web page that would allow people to report sightings themselves online. And although it seems very simple now, at the time web mapping was a new thing, and I didn't understand it well enough to even to give them a quote on what it would take to do that. Another example might be construction sites. I worked on a project that involved stormwater management on a pipeline project, and a company had to provide recommendations to the construction crews about where to install stormwater control structures. And so that data was constantly changing as our crews were making new recommendations, and the people in the office wanted to be able to see that right away. Something else to think about are the processes that change the features that you're mapping. 
For instance, things like rivers and sand dunes change much more frequently than lakes or forests. Often non-spatial attribute data will change more frequently than spatial data. In our project, for instance, although we occasionally find a new nest, or have to remove a nest that was destroyed, it's far more common that the nest location itself remains for several years, but its status can change from inactive to active several times each year. So that's just a matter of changing one of the attributes. We don't have to change the actual spatial location. Sometimes the data itself doesn't change much once it's created, but we're constantly finding and entering new data. So the data set as a whole is changing. For instance, I worked on a project where we had to survey a 60 mile long transmission line project for wetlands, and it took us two months. Once we found a wetland, it didn't change, but we were finding and mapping new wetlands every day. And again, our client wanted to see the new wetlands that we were mapping as soon as we mapped them, because it was affecting their design process in their office. So these terms, static and dynamic, are relative terms. DEMs in general may not change very often, but after a volcanic eruption or a flood, they might change very quickly over a small area. We also need to consider the timescales at which accurate data is important to you. Yearly updates may be more than enough for soils data, and you may not need a server-side component at all. Daily updates may be enough for construction projects, and you could load data in the morning and store it locally until the next day. On the other hand, consider again the Uber application. If the locations of its cars are older than five minutes, then they're pretty much worthless. And so in this case, we need constant updates of large amounts of data. And given the rate at which internet connectivity is advancing, it's likely that in 10 years we will have very fast access to data over the internet, from anywhere on the planet very cheaply. Until then, however, we have to consider the trade-offs between speed, data usage, and accuracy when designing our web applications. This is especially true with applications designed for mobile devices, because you're probably going to have to pay per gigabyte for data transfer over cellular networks, and it's not going to be as fast as a hardwired internet connection in your office. You could improve performance and decrease data usage by storing data locally, but that data would become out of date relatively quickly. You could request the most current data every second, but if you're paying for data, it could get very expensive, and if your connection is slow, it might decrease performance. And so these are questions to think about when you're designing your application. But there's no right answer. The decisions that you make will depend on your specific project, your budget, your data, and many other factors. But it's good to keep these things in the back of your mind as we go through the course, and preferably in the front of your mind as you think about applying what you learn to your specific application. In the next lecture, we'll talk about some of the software that we'll be using in this course. It should be a fairly short lecture, as if you've taken the prerequisites, as I assume you have, then you should already be familiar with the software and have it installed in this course. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next lecture.